Well, hello, it's great to be with you. And uh, what a joy it is to look forward to meeting together physically uh, next week. Uh, but uh, we still have God's word to feed us this morning. So let's bow our heads and pray uh, as we begin. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you that your spirit continues to speak to us through the words of the Bible. And so we pray that wherever we are, you'd help us to listen, help us to concentrate, help us to understand, and help us to change the way we think about you and to live differently in the light of what we hear from you. We ask this for your glory and in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, our studies in Job are raising important questions. Questions about God's will for our lives. Theologians speak of God's will in two dimensions. Firstly, his prescriptive will, that is his commands revealed in scripture, which we should obey. For example, it is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, 1 Thessalonians 4. This is a will he doesn't enforce, as we know from our own lives, as much as from the scandalous sin recently exposed in some Christian leaders. So that's his prescriptive will, his commands in scripture. But secondly then, they, they speak of his decretive will, that is his sovereign direction of all things, which apart from what we're told he's doing in scripture is largely hidden from us, but which we can trust absolutely. As Paul puts it in Ephesians 1, the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. Now that will does include the sin of human beings. For example, Jesus was crucified unjustly by wicked men, but the apostles pray, they did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen, Acts 4. And so Peter writes, it is better to suffer for doing good if that should be God's will, 1 Peter 3. In other words, God's will may include the sinful actions of other people. And his sovereign will also includes suffering. Not only the eternal punishment, which unforgivers sinners must face after the day of judgment when Christ returns, and not only the suffering of loving discipline that God brings upon his people to train us in godliness, but also, as we've been thinking in recent weeks, in innocent suffering. In Job's case, this was the loss of his fortune, the slaughter of his servants, and the tragic death of all ten of his children, as well as the personal affliction of painful boils all over his body. Now we know as readers from Job chapters 1 to 2 what Job, Job doesn't know. That God is allowing Satan to test Job's faith to prove that Job's faith is not just a mercenary desire for God's blessings but a real heartfelt love for God. In Job 3 to 28 as we've been seeing Job has resisted the religious assumptions of his miserable friends who insist he can't be innocent. It must be that he's being punished for his sin. But Job understands that by faith in God, he has been forgiven for his sin. And it is acceptable to God in God's righteousness, which we now know has been provided in the beautiful life of Jesus. So in other words, God's sovereign will which is unfolding in history and in our lives, does bring sin and suffering into our lives, but not in the same way or with the same joy that God brings blessings. But he is still in sovereign control. Now, Job's suffering helps us to understand four good purposes that God tells us in his word are why he allows suffering and brings suffering into the lives of his children. Firstly, to purify our faith. As Job's sufferings were purifying his faith, so 1 Peter 1 tells us, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials, so the proven genuineness of your faith 
may result in praise, glory and honour when Jesus Christ is revealed. And later he writes, Your enemy, the devil, prowls round like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith. Because you know the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. So God can bring good in our lives from the suffering that he brings into our lives. For example, as many of you will know, and Jen's uh, given me permission to to mention this, uh, Jen Johnston has um, often shared that her experience of breast cancer forced her and her family to recognise that she is not the rock on which her family depends, as she did like to imagine, but rather that God is the rock on which her family can depend. And so her faith and their faith was purified through that cancer. Secondly, the Bible teaches us to conform us to Jesus. As Job's sufferings made him more like Jesus in faith that endures innocent suffering, Paul writes, in all things, that's including our suffering, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And what is that? That we might be conformed to the image of his son. And I don't know whether you've noticed how people who suffered are so often kinder and more like Jesus as a result of it. So to purify our faith, to conform us to Jesus. Thirdly, to serve the salvation of others. As Job's sufferings include enduring the cruel accusations of his friends by clinging resolutely to his confidence in God, so Paul wrote, Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, for Christians. Now he's not speaking of Christ's suffering for sin, which was completed on the cross. He's speaking of the costs of mission in this world, which includes both the persecution that we face from those who hate God and his gospel, that is when we take up our cross to follow Jesus, and also the costs of being in a broken world. Now, both of those costs are experienced in our lives, the costs of persecution, hostility, and the cost of just being here in a broken world afflicted with COVID and cancer. But God can use our faith in the midst of sufferings to bring others to Christ. I I remember when I was much younger that um, uh, when we lived in Australia, there was a lady called Beatty who uh, died of cancer and her joy in Christ in the midst of her cancer gathered lots of her unbelieving friends until there was a group of about 30, all of whom came to faith in Jesus as she died of her cancer. There's a remarkable example of how God used her faith in the midst of her suffering to bring others to Christ. And many of us will have stories of how we were brought to Jesus or persuaded of his goodness as we saw people cling to him in suffering. And fourthly, to glorify God in the heavenly realms. So to purify our faith, conform us to Jesus, serve the salvation of others, and to glorify God in the heavenly realms. As we know, God is allowing Job's suffering to refute Satan's boast that no one serves God except for the benefits. Paul also writes, put on the full armour of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Our faith, you see, declares in the heavenly realms that God is good. Having said all that, we do need to realise that Job points to Jesus. While there's much for us to learn from Job about enduring our own innocent suffering, we'll see perhaps more clearly today that the extremes of Job's experience and the boldness of his claims point to somebody unique. The one who came from the glory of heaven to the horrors of the cross, who alone was purely innocent in himself. The innocent sufferings of Job point us in the end to the innocent sufferings of Jesus. And we'll think more about that as we go on. Now, today's section is um, quite long. It's three chapters. And so rather than have a reading of it, which would take a long time, we're going to read it as we go through. 
And so I'll read those passages quickly and they'll come up on screen. So if you don't have your own device or Bible open, you can see all the words on screen. These are the final words of Job. I'll tell you where we're going. Three parts. Chapter 29, his longing for lost respect. Then chapter 30, his lament at the scorn he now suffers. And then chapter 31, his confidence that God will find him innocent. Let's look at each in turn. So first in chapter 29, his longing. I was once respected. We're hearing the longings of Job's heart for a respect that he once enjoyed, but it actually points us to something he and we will enjoy in the future. So first in verses one to six, he yearned for his lost friendship with God. So even before grieving the loss of his children, he yearns for the restoration of his close relationship with God. Look with me at verse one. How I long for the months gone by, for the days when God watched over me, when his lamp shone on my head and by his light I walked through darkness. So Job missed God's protective presence, not just benefits from God, but fellowship with God, guiding him as a moral light through the darkness of this world. And then he says, verse four, Oh, for the days when I was in my prime, when God's intimate friendship blessed my house, when the Almighty was still with me and my children were around me. He remembers his prime, we might say, the good old days, but not in terms of physical prowess or social success, but spiritual intimacy with God, his friendship with God. Now, more than that, Verse six, he says, when my path was drenched with cream and the rock poured out for me streams of olive oil. Both are pictures of abundant blessing from God. We might think it's a bit strange having a path drenched with cream. Sounds a bit slippery, doesn't it? And the rock poured out oil, that seems odd. But both are pictures of abundant joy from his relationship with God. But it's not for selfish reasons. In seven to 17, we find that he yearned for his lost capacity to serve other people. He looks back to the time when he could really help people. Perhaps we can uh, imagine the scene, an ancient Middle Eastern town with a market square at the heart of the community where business was conducted and legal disputes were decided. Job remembers how it used to be. Look at verse seven. When I went to the gate of the city, took my seat in the public square. The young men saw me and stepped aside, and the old men rose to their feet. The chief men refrained from speaking, covered their mouths with their hands. The voices of the nobles were hushed, and their tongues stuck to the roofs of their mouths. In other words, public respect. Even the chiefs and the nobles stopped talking when Job arrived. They wanted to hear from him. And why was he so highly regarded? Well, look at verse 11. Whoever heard me spoke well of me, and those who saw me commended me, and here it is, because I rescued the poor who cried for help, and the fatherless who had none to assist them. The one who was dying blessed me, and I made the widow's heart sing. I put on righteousness as my clothing. Justice was my robe and my turban. I was eyes to the blind and feet to the lame. I was a father to the needy. I took up the cause of the stranger. I broke the fangs of the wicked and snatched the victims from their teeth. In other words, he was respected because of his compassion. It wasn't his wealth it was his compassion for the poor, for orphans, for the dying, for widows. He provided practical aid to the disabled. He defended children, immigrants, and victims of crime. <clears throat> his robe and turban of office were his kindness. Now these categories, of course, are deepened in the New Testament to include evangelistic compassion for spiritual needs, for sinners, our poor foreigners to God, in need of a saviour and a loving heavenly father. But 
Job was yearning for his lost joy in sacrificially serving other people. And that was what gave him the respect of his community. And so, therefore, verses 18 to 20, he yearned for his old confidence for the future. He used to feel so confident and full of hope. Look at verse 18. I thought, I'll die in my own house. My days as numerous as the grains of sand. My roots will reach to the water and the dew will lie all night on my branches. My glory will not fade. The bow will be ever new in my hand. In other words, he expected to live a long and happy life, dying peacefully in his own bed, surrounded by his large and loving family, vigorous and strong to the end. Indeed, verses 21 to 25, he yearned for the dignity of his leadership. Look at verse 21. People listened to me expectantly. They're waiting in silence for my counsel. After I'd spoken, they spoke no more. My words fell gently on their ears. They waited for me as for showers and drank in my words as, as the spring rain. When I smiled at them, they scarcely believed it. The light of my face was precious to them. I chose the way for them. I sat as their chief. I dwelt as a king amongst his troops. I was like one who comforts mourners. You see, people respected Job so much that they waited patiently for his opinion. And after he spoke, no one ever dreamt of contradicting him or trying to improve what he said. They were just so grateful for his wisdom. The crowds were refreshed by his teaching, like parched ground is regenerated by spring rain. He was a, something like what we would call a celebrity. People felt excited if he just smiled at them. For he brought the light of God into their lives. In fact, he led them like a king commanding an army. He was appreciated for his efforts. Now, Job's recollection of lost blessings here, of the days gone past, so much in contrast with his poverty and agony now, has echoes from the past, recalling not just his own earlier life, but actually going back to the Paradise Garden of Eden, where Adam and Eve once walked with God in intimate friendship with him and together ruled over creation. But prim primarily, this longing points forward to Job, and then to Jesus, and to us. Firstly, to Job, for he will be totally restored by God at the end of Job. All these blessings that he longs for will be his once more. They also point forward to Jesus, for Jesus enjoyed perfect friendship with God as his father. Jesus' capacity for serving others extended even to dying to save us from all our earthly troubles for the delights of heaven. Jesus' confidence was expressed in promising to rise from the dead. And Jesus' dignity and leadership has now been established by his ascension to rule in glory as the king of kings from where he leads us in his global mission. So certainly Job's categories point forward to Jesus. But they also point forward to us. For through faith in Jesus, we can share in these privileges. We can enjoy intimate friendship with Jesus, the friend of sinners. I remember a wonderful little book, well, I've heard of a little booklet written by J.C. Ryle, the great bishop and writer from the past, who, said, who wrote a little booklet just called, Do You Need a Friend? He was speaking, of course, of Jesus, the friend of sinners, the best friend any person can have. And we enjoy the capacity of Christ's Holy Spirit within us to serve people sacrificially in every way, but especially with evangelism. We can enjoy confidence to face death in the sure and certain hope of resurrection to be with him in heaven. And we can look forward to the dignity. It may be that in this life we're nothing much, but we look forward to the dignity together sharing in the rule of Christ over the new creation one day. So that's how um, Job is longing for the past. He's longing for a respect that will one day be shared by us all in Jesus. Right, that's chapter 29. How are you doing? Still with us? Right, secondly, chapter 30. Now we come to his lament. I'm now scorned. So here is the contrast with the previous chapter. 
Everything's changed now because Job has been engulfed by suffering. And although Job is actually far wiser now in his suffering than ever he was when he knew only blessing, worldly people tend to scorn the weak and only want to listen to the strong. And so in this chapter we find, firstly, he is mocked by the ignorant. Look at verse 1. But now they mock me, men younger than I. In other words, Job is forced to listen to ignorant but arrogant young men. It says, whose fathers I would have disdained to put with my sheepdogs. In other words, they come from crude families. Of what use was the strength of their hands to me, since their vigour had gone from them? In other words, they're lazy and useless men. Haggard from want and hunger, they roamed the parched land in desolate wastelands at night. In the brush they gathered salt herbs, and their food was the root of the broom bush. Now that starts to sound a bit strange to us, but I think Job is not criticising the genuine poor. He is criticising scroungers who are too lazy to work. He says, they were banished from human society, shouted at as if they were thieves. They were forced to live in the dry stream beds amongst the rocks and in holes in the ground. They brayed, that is like donkeys, amongst the bushes and huddled in the undergrowth. A base and nameless brood, they were driven out of the land. Again, he's not speaking of the victims of injustice. He's talking of feral gangs of antisocial yobs. And Job has to endure their mockery. How, how has he been brought so low? Answer, because he's afflicted by God. Look at verse 9. And now those young men mock me in song. I've become a byword amongst them. They detest me and keep their distance. They don't hesitate to spit in my face. In other words, they tell jokes about him and humiliate him. You know, Have you heard the one about Job who lost ten children in a single day? Now that's what I call careless. Ha 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 ha! That kind of thing. Now, because God has brought him down, he pictures these jobs as armies assaulting him. He says, on my right, the tribe attacks. They lay snares for my feet. They build their siege ramps against me. They break up my road. They succeed in destroying me. No one can help him, they say. They advance us through a gaping bre uh, breach. Amid the ruins, they come rolling in. You see, they're mocking him. That powerful man is, well, he's powerless now, isn't he? Terrors overwhelm me, says Job. My dignity is driven away as by the wind. My safety vanishes like a cloud. In other words, like so many, perhaps of the elderly amongst us, he's too frightened to go out now because he's so terribly vulnerable. Job knows, you see, that he's afflicted by God because he is abandoned by God. Verse 16. And now my life ebbs away, days of suffering grip me, night pierces my bones, my gnawing pains never rest. In his great power, God becomes like clothing to me, he binds me like the neck of my garment. He throws me into the mud and I am reduced to dust and ashes. You see, he's saying God has trapped me in a vicious downward spiral which can only end in the mud of the grave. And now he turns to address God directly. He says, I cry out to you, God, but you don't answer. I stand up, but you merely look at me. You turn on me ruthlessly. With the might of your hand, you attack me. You snatch me and drive me before the wind. You toss me about in the storm. I know that you'll bring me down to death, to the place appointed for all the living. Do you see the anguish of his heart? God, you're ignoring my prayers. It's like you've sucked me up in a tornado of your wrath and you're spinning me around and you're ready to slam me down on the ground in death. And then verse 24, can you hear his lament? Surely no one lays a hand on a broken man when he cries for help in his distress. Have I not wept for those in trouble? Has not my soul grieved for the poor? Yet when I hoped for good, evil come. When I looked for light, then came darkness. Do you see, he's saying... I have been kind. I've been sympathetic to people in need. But when I need help, I've just been abandoned. He says, the churning inside me never stops. Days of suffering confront me. I go about blackened, but not by the sun. I stand up in the assembly. I cry for help. 
I've become a brother of jackals, a companion of owls. My skin grows black and peels. My body burns with fever. My lyre, that's his musical instrument, is tuned to mourning, and my pipe to the sound of wailing. You may not have got all the words, but you hear Job is experiencing anguish in his heart and agony in his body. Wailing like a jackal or owl, he's burning hot with fever. He can't stop weeping in his misery. But nobody seems willing to help him. God seems to have just abandoned him. He's like the king who later in Psalm 69 cries out, Scorn has broken my heart and has left me helpless. I looked for sympathy, but there was none, for comforters, but I found none. Speaking, of course, of the king, who, when betrayed by Jesus, Jesus I'm so sorry, who, was, when betrayed by Judas, was abandoned by his friends, condemned by his own people, tortured by soldiers, and nailed like a criminal to a cross to die in excruciating pain, and cried out in the desolate words of Psalm 22, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You see, Job's anguish points forward to Jesus' anguish. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? And we now know the answer for us to save us from the consequences of our sin. So that's chapter 2. Do you hear the lament, the anguish of his heart? His lament is, I'm now scorned. Remember his longing? I was once respected. 29. Chapter 30, his lament. But now I'm scorned and abandoned by God. And yet, lastly, chapter 31, his confidence. I will be judged innocent. In the midst of extreme suffering, Job remains strangely certain that God knows he's innocent. It's not, as we might first think reading this chapter, because he's a self-righteous Pharisee, convinced that he's so good that God should save him, but rather because he's convinced that by faith in God, he is considered by God's grace to be innocent. And so he lists his godliness, not because he thinks he's good enough to escape God's judgment, but as the proof that he is one of God's forgiven sinners. For these are the marks of someone who is considered righteous by God, and therefore becomes more righteous in their lives. And so it's a list of goodness. It's a wonderful aspiration for us all. It begins in verses 1 to 3. He says, I've made a covenant with my eyes, a commitment, a contract. He says, look, verse 1. I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a young woman. For what is our lot from God above, our heritage from the Almighty and High? Is it not ruin for the wicked, disaster for those who do wrong? In other words, he begins with the central ethic of inner purity, to restrain even the lust of his heart. For he knows that impurity deserve God's wrath. What a high commitment that is, a covenant with his eyes, not to look lustfully at anyone else. And so in verses 4 to 6, he invites God, he says, let God judge me and know I am blameless. See what he says, verse 4? Does he not see my ways and count my every step? If I have walked with falsehood or my foot has hurried after deceit, let God weigh me in honest scales and he'll know that I am blameless. In other words, Job knows he's accountable to God's assessment but he's confident of what we know is true from chapter 1, where God himself has already told us that he is blameless. Not that he's perfect, but that he walks with the upright integrity of God's people. And so now he proceeds into a long list of sins that he avoids as examples of his godliness. Again, I just want to emphasize, he's not claiming he deserves salvation, but this is the proof that he has been saved by God's grace. And and he simply clings to that. He can't believe that God's salvation is not still true of him. I'm not going to go through them in detail, but I will give you the headings of them. And so what he lists here is my catalogue of faithfulness in verses 7 to 34. Here's what you won't find in Job's life. 
as you certainly won't find it in Jesus' life. So firstly, verse 7, never wayward. If my steps have turned from the path, if my heart has been led by my eyes, he's saying, my heart has never walked away from loving you, God, as so many love the bling of Wimbledon wealth all around. He says, I've never been wayward. Verse 9, never adulterous. If my heart has been enticed by a woman or if I have lurked at my neighbor's door. In other words, he's never opened his heart to the porn on his laptop or a fling in the office. Verse 13, never unjust. If I had denied justice to any of my servants. In other words, he's never exploited his staff or denied justice to those with a fair complaint. Verse 16, never selfish. If I have denied the desires of the poor or let the eyes of the widow grow weary. In other words, he's never ignored opportunities to help the needy. Verse 21, never abusive. If I have raised my hand against the fatherless, knowing that I had influence in court, he's not taken advantage of his power in order to take advantage of those who are disempowered. Verse 24, never materialistic. It says, if I have put my trust in gold or said to pure gold, you're my security. So he hasn't allowed himself to trust in his great wealth to look after him rather than God. Verse 26, never idolatrous. He says, if I have regarded the sun in its radiance or the moon moving in splendor so that my heart was secretly enticed. He said, I've never devoted myself to astrology or to nature. Verse 29, never vindictive. If I have rejoiced at my enemy's misfortune. He's never taken that vengeful delight in the misfortune of others that sometimes lurks in our hearts. Verse 31, never unwelcoming. If those of my household have never said, who has not been filled with Job's meat. In other words, he's saying he's never neglected offering food and hospitality to anyone who needed it. And verse 33, never hypocritical. If I have concealed my sin as people do by hiding my guilt in my heart because I so feared the crowd, he's never claimed to be faultless or failed to apologize and repent of his sin. So there are 10 th- sins you won't find in Job's life. Indeed, he concludes, let the Almighty judge me, 35 to 37. He says, oh, that I had someone to hear me. I sign now my defense. Let the Almighty answer me. Let my accuser put his indictment in writing. In other words, here's my defense. If only Almighty God would listen. Indeed, he ends in verse 38 to 40. The earth will attest to my innocence. It says, if my land cries out against me and all its furrows are wet with tears, if I have devoured its yield without payment or broken the spirit of its tenants, then let briars come up instead of wheat and stinkweed instead of barley. It's a bit strange to us, but I think Job is confident here that the fruitfulness of his land that he has tended and cared for testifies to his faithfulness to his creator. And so, the words of Job are ended. And apart from a couple of comments in the rest of the book, that's it from Job. The words of Job are ended. So how are we to read these protestations of innocence? His confidence when he says, I'm going to be judged innocent, I know I will. Surely these are, this is a confidence far beyond what any of us would claim. He's not lying. He's not exaggerating. He's not speaking prophetic words that only Jesus could actually say. For at the end of the book, God will declare Job to have been faithful. Now, he's describing the innocent life which Jesus will live perfectly for us, which shapes anybody, including Job, who has faith in him. So yes, this list, they are the aspirations for us for life. And it's good to read these and think, how could I be like this? How can I repent of these sins? They are a description of his life. 
But supremely, they point to the only person who's ever lived like this perfectly. And so, like Job, as we conclude, our confidence is in the innocence of Jesus. Our only confidence of being declared innocent of all these sins and many more, in that of all of them, and of being welcomed into heaven on judgment day, is in Jesus' innocent life. The innocent life that saved Job, the innocent life that can save us. In other words, if we will put our faith in Jesus, of whom this description is perfectly true, we shall be acceptable to God and can be confident that we are acceptable to God, as Job was convinced he was acceptable to God, in the righteousness of God in Jesus, in his pure and perfect and beautiful and loving life. And it will have its influence in our lives by his spirit to become more like Job ourselves. Do you understand? This is a description of the innocence of Jesus. And in his innocence, we can be counted and accepted as innocent by God. And then over time, this is what we'll become more like as his spirit makes this true in our lives. So if you haven't already put your faith in Jesus, can I appeal to you even this morning? You and I are not naturally like this, are we? We are not innocent of these things. So our only hope is to put our faith in the one of whom this description is perfectly true, that is Jesus. Why not do that today? And cling to him from now on as the friend of sinners, the innocent life that we need to be saved by God. Let's bow our heads and pray together. Almighty God, we thank you for this extraordinary part of scripture, a torrent of text and longings from Job for the respect that he wants to enjoy, the lament of his heart that he's now scorned, and yet the confidence that he has that he's innocent in your eyes. And we recognise that we are not innocent in ourselves. And so, Lord Jesus, we do want to cling to you. Yours is the innocent life. Yours is the perfect and beautiful, loving life described here by Job. And so we do want to put our faith in you that yours is the innocence that can save us, that we might go through judgment and into your presence forever. And we thank you that when we put our faith in you, this is also the direction of travel, that this is how you are leading us to become more like you, even through suffering, like in Job's life. And so, Lord, please help us to accept the sufferings that you bring into our life, knowing that there are good purposes in it, supremely that we might become more like Jesus, that we might be innocent, as Job has described himself here. Lord Jesus, friend of sinners, we cling to you, and however hard life is now for us, please help us to be confident that in you we are loved and acceptable to God. And we ask it in your name. Amen.